wonderful welcome, everyone. Coming to you from the Toby Family Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club of California, it's week to week, the political roundtable from Monday, March 26, 2018. Welcome, everybody. This has been one of the most riveting political times, I think, of my life. <laughs> it's been unclear if we're heading toward a constitutional crisis or if it's just going to be the same, same old, same old with different faces. But uh, whatever the outcome and whatever the news we discuss, uh, week to week is our joint communal effort to try to make sense of things and to keep civic discussion of politics alive and to do it with a smile. So I'm John Zipper, your host for week to week and the Commonwealth Club's vice president of media and editorial. On today's program, we're going to discuss the political travails of Facebook, San Francisco's mayoral election, state races, uh, the March for Our Lives, and of course, the latest news about the president. And we'll end everything with our week to week live news quiz. Uh, the Commonwealth Club is a place for people with a wide variety of views, so we always say any opinions that are expressed here are those solely of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. Now, speaking of the speakers, let's introduce them. Starting on the far end of the stage is our frequent panelist, Bob Butler, and he's also a reporter for KCBS Radio, and you can find him on Twitter at BobButler7. So welcome back, Bob. Thank you. Next to him, joining our panel for the first time is Rachel Swan, who can fill you in on all things City Hall related, because that's her beat as a staff writer at the San Francisco Chronicle. She's on Twitter at Rachel Swan. So welcome, Rachel. I would congratulate you for joining the panel, but I actually have on my notes, it says, do not congratulate. <laughs> it's all in caps, so I think it's important. So I won't be doing that. Good you didn't screw that one up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just dodge that one. Uh, next to me is Carson Bruno, Assistant Dean for Admissions and Program Relations at Pepperdine University's School of Public Policy, also a former Hoover Institution Research Fellow. He's on Twitter at Carson J.F. Bruno, so welcome back. Thanks. <laughs> you know uh, the drill, there are question cards throughout the room, write down questions. People will collect them and bring them up to me and I'll try to ask as many as I can during our hour here together. Um, so on to our round table. Now, more than a decade ago, it was during an inform program at the Commonwealth Club, a young man wearing a hoodie, t-shirt, sat on a panel discussion talking about online personas. That man, of course, was Mark Zuckerberg. His company, Facebook, has been under, a, I guess, kind of withering criticism lately um, it, over how the company is handled or mishandled did the data, the billion plus online personas that are on the system. Now at the center of the controversy is a company called Cambridge Analytics. It's a political firm once tied to former Trump advisor Stephen Bannon. Now the company reportedly got and used, according to their own rules, uh, personal data from 50 million users of Facebook. Only about 270,000 of those users consented to have their data shared in this manner. The reason they got so many was it became not just them, but their friends and friends of friends. So Facebook has taken out full page newspaper ads apologizing for this data scandal. It's probably the nicest thing Facebook has ever done for print media. Um, Carson, <laughs> Carson, uh, let me start with you. Uh, this has become a political thing I and mean, we've got states and, and localities and, and US senators who are all looking for investigations and, and, and hearings on this. Why do you think this is, do you think this is a real issue that they're going to get anything out of or this is, they're going to, at the end of the day, come to, well, this is how the system runs. I mean, nothing we can do. Well, I guess, no, I think it is a real issue and it ought to be a real issue um, if you think about it. Uh, you know, as someone who has admittedly grown up in the Facebook world, I mean, my, I'm gonna age myself right now. Uh, my freshman year of undergrad was when Facebook went completely universal in college campuses. Um, and so I've literally, my entire adult life has, is literally on Facebook. I'm afraid that my f freshman year was like <laughs> when he was born. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you the year, but you can probably re reverse engineer that. Um, so you have, I mean, not only now my whole generation on Facebook, yeah. but you have everyone be, you know, after me, but and also now all of my parents, my grandparents, you know, are on Facebook. It is a massive collection of what we presumably care about in our personal lives. Not only just our personal data of you know, 
basic stuff like birthdays and phone numbers and email addresses, but kind of what we are sharing with, with one another, those cat videos versus the political videos versus whatever it may be. Uh, a lot of data that um, we just voluntarily put out there into, this, into the space, uh, not really thinking of the ramifications of what that data actually is. And part of Facebook's problem, I think, has always been this idea of how do you monetize this platform? It's something that they've been I mean, ridiculed by uh, Wall Street from the very, very get-go of how do you monetize this social networking system? It's our data. And while they've always kind of jumped around that kind of particular point, um, at the end of the day, we all know that they have been using our data in ways that we may not be fully comfortable with. How many of you have gone on to Facebook uh, after you've searched something on the internet, and all of a sudden there are ads for that product or that vacation or whatever it may be, all of a sudden spamming you. It's pretty creepy. Um, if you think about it, stop and think about it, but very few of us actually stop to think about it. Um, what this scandal really is doing is unleashing kind of what the ramifications are of sharing this information. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the Hillary Clinton campaign was also using this information in some capacity. Now, maybe not with Cambridge, obviously not with Cambridge Analytics, but with some other firm. Uh, so this is not something that is just this evil Trump kind of conspiracy theory. It's something that every campaign uses. Um, but it's something that we're going to have to really try to figure out what is the appropriate use of these social networking platforms, what's the appropriate use of our privacy. Um, and it's something that we'll see a lot of, I think, in DC, but the state's attorney generals um, attorneys general are going to be much more active, I think, on this topic than they should be. Yeah. Rachel, what do you think? What are your thoughts on Facebook and its current travails? Gosh, I don't, I'm so, like, I'm so behind on like, um, <laughs> Are you a Facebook I guess user? I am a, face, I am a Facebook user. Um, I guess, well, can I just play devil's Please? advocate here? Um, I'm worried I'm going to get like tarred and feathered, but like not on this panel. Go for okay. it. Okay. I mean, do you think like do you think privacy is a little overrated? I mean, yeah. like <laughs> you're putting your information out oh, yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that is an honest isn't argument. it? Your no, I, I'm no, just like, I mean, I, you're just, right. Just, people, I, people are willingly putting their information yeah. I just I just feel like like do you, I mean people are people are responsible for their own opinions. And I mean, you know, like, isn't it our fault if we're just duped by Russian bots or? Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, I so know. think about it, you're on Facebook, you list your likes, which often include, yeah. you know, Hillary Clinton for president or Ted Cruz for president or whatever. Um, you know, all your music f loves and movies yeah. and books. And the whole point of that is not really for you to have those connections to other people. It's yeah. so that they can target down to Okay. And Granted, you know, I'm like totally freaked out that two years ago I was getting ads for like freezing eggs and now I'm getting ads for like <laughs> dye your roots. So like, <laughs> it does like, it does like, it does completely freak me out. It does completely freak me out. But like, I'm like, oh my God, they know so much. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but I don't know, but it's, it's my fault, right? For putting that stuff out there. But I, well. I mean, yeah. there's, there's an argument, I guess, to, to your point about what is the appropriate level of privacy that we are allowing ourselves to retain, uh, given the amount of activity we are voluntarily mm -hmm. engaging on these platforms? I think the heart of the problem comes to, you know, we go into these platforms expecting a certain level of privacy, and are they sticking to that level of privacy that's advertised? Um, but then also they change those levels of privacy so consistent, consistently. I, for instance, on Facebook, I, about five or six years ago, I made it so that no one could actually find me, um, that I would have to friend you first. Now all of a sudden I'm getting friend requests. So at some point, Facebook changed their algorithm, the way that they did the kind of privacy settings that I'm now searchable on Facebook um, without me really knowing that was the case. They all, they is all, that allowed? You know, yeah, is that but, appropriate? But, th but that happens also with your credit cards and everything else. You mm -hmm. always get these things in the mail. Oh, we changed privacy policy. Yes. And you know, uh, how many people actually read those things? Right. You just throw them away. And then you find out that you've, you've all of a sudden given them permission to sell your information to anybody and everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I still get calls to this day from Canadian pharmacy. I've never 
bought anything from Canadian Pharmacy. And every time they call me, I know it's them because there's nothing on the, on the line. Then you hear like a beep, and then all of a sudden, I just hang up on them. But it, it's right. very, it's, it's just maddening that with social media now, there's so, much, so many ways for them to get at you. You talked about you put your information out there, your likes. I don't have any likes on my Facebook page. Every time I get an ad, I, I, I get tired of doing it. You know, I don't want to see this ad. Why not? And they ask you all these damn, look, I don't want to see it. Just take <laughs> it down. I still to this day can't figure out why I'm getting all of these emails from these Russian women who say they know me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's Facebook or what, but, it, but my, I mean, my major concern with what's going on with Facebook it really has more to do with, and I see this on my Facebook page, and I have Facebook friends who, you know, obviously are very political, um, and they post things that I just know are false. And, but you can't convince them that they're false because, you know, they got it from a source that they, tr they strongly believe in, even though many people in the media look at these sources and just laugh. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's their reality. And so you can't, you, you can't, you know, berate them, you can't, you, you, you can try to inform them, but they don't want to be informed either. So that's, I think, the biggest problem with what's going on with Facebook and social media in general. Um, and I should note, uh, Carson, if you want to be on an online platform and have no one find you, you go to Google Plus. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> <Yeah>. Never know. <laughs> that, uh, that enigma. <laughs> someone from the audience notes that Ted Cruz used uh, uh, Cambridge Analytics before mm. uh, Donald Trump did. Yeah, a few of them. I mean, Mimi Walters, I guess, in down Southern California has as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bob Huff, who is former state senator and, uh, and running for Congress right now, has. So, I mean, it, it's not, I mean, this is a, I mean, it's actually a reputable organization, or at, at least until sure. a certain point. Um, but Well, and again, yeah. it was doing what, so uh, you might have seen the news that uh, Elon Musk pulled Tesla and SpaceX's pages off of Facebook. And very few other advertisers are following, or you know, advertisers or companies. Why? Because they're all using that data for the same reason. Mm -hmm. I want to find people of a certain wealth who seem to be ready to buy a car. They've probably liked expensive cars, and and they've taken quizzes as to what kind of car do you most resemble in the past. You know, I mean, <laughs> that they they've got a lot riding on that. So there's a lot baked into just keeping this going. Well, you talk about Ted Cruz. I mean. I I think he's easily fooled because I saw this great photo, I think on Twitter, was he's taking a photo with somebody, a selfie with somebody, yes. and she, ha she has a sign saying, what Texas needs is less Tess Cru Ted Cruz. I mean, it was, and he's just, just smiling. It was, <laughs> A bad, that's a bad handler right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, she says she, she had her coat closed, and then right before they snapped the picture, she opened, unbuttoned her jacket. <laughs> Pretty slick. That's some trolling. <laughs> uh, someone else in the audience notes uh, Jackie Spears, who shared the comment, and this has been said by others, that remember that we users of Facebook are the, pro are the product. It's the customers of Facebook are the advertisers. So um, basically, we should know better. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Let's move on to our next topic. And I want to go with Rachel, because this is her beat. And the beat you've been covering, Rachel, at City Hall in San Francisco has been very interesting of late. Uh, we all know about the June 5th election to se select a replacement for Mayor Ed Lee, who died back in December. And we all know that Board of Supervisors President London Breed, who became acting mayor upon Lee's death, was replaced in d January by District 2 Supervisor Mark Farrell, who is not running for a permanent gig as mayor. He says he's done with politics, at least for a while, after June 5th. But Rachel, something's happened recently with the NAACP. What, what, are, what are they doing and, and what does it all mean? Well, they uh, last week filed a Brown Act complaint to the okay. district attorney and two ethics bodies in the city, the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force and the Ethics Commission, um, saying that the progressive supervisors who uh, voted for interim Mark Farrell in the mayor's office, to, to be in the, installed in the mayor's office, mm -hmm. thereby removing London Breed, that they violated the Brown Act by plotting out this vote. Um, I will say, as someone who covers the Board of Supervisors and my offices in City Hall, um, this is this is not uncommon. <laughs> like, what is not uncommon, though? Uh, for them to count out votes ahead of every single piece of legislation. Yeah. Um, you know, like, it's part of the... 
it may in fact violate the, they may in fact routinely violate the Brown Act. I think they did. And can you explain yeah. the Brown Act? I'm sorry. The, the Brown Act is this, is a state law that, um, it's like a public records law and a government transparency law. Mm -hmm. And it mandates that if a certain number of legislators are meeting together, that it has to be noticed and there has to be an agenda published and the public has to know about it. Because it's in essence kind of a, a, a meeting of that body, just not complete. So exactly, it's okay. exactly. Government meetings have to be transparent and they have to be open to the public. And you know, the public has to be able to comment and they have to deliberate in front of the public. And I mean, there's, you know, it's part of our democratic process. And so in this case, what's being alleged is that the progressive supervisors had what are called serial one-on-one -on -one meetings where, you know, it's okay for two supervisors to get together for a beer after work and talk about Stormy Daniels or whatever. Um, what they're saying in this complaint is that uh, the supervisors were trying to count out six votes to get London Breed out so that yeah. they could get a babysitter in the mayor's office so that they'd have an easier chance of having a progressive in the June election. So three supervisor, two supervisors met for lunch and then three supervisors met at a bar. And actually this did happen. <laughs> and then, you know, two more supervisors met at a cafe and they all kind of, maybe these meetings didn't individually violate the Brown Act, but taken together, they were a part of this coordinated plot, if you will. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what, is, what is this uh, this case, what is it seeking? Is it seeking to have London Breed reinstalled back in the, in the office? I mean, what's the status of this? What would happen? I mean, no. Like, okay. It, for as a practical matter, no. Like the DA is going to investigate this. They have to investigate everything that comes before them. Even, yeah, they have to investigate everything that comes before this them. Um, in all likelihood, they will investigate this long after the June fifth election. It will. Th however, however, um, the effect that it has on the June fifth election is it keeps the narrative of London Breed being ousted in the public eye in the media. Um, if you're a London Supreme, if like Amos Brown, the head of the San Francisco chapter of the NAACP who filed the complaint mm -hmm. is a London Breed supporter. You know, he's appeared at fundraising events with her. I mean, that is true. You know, so, you know, when I spoke with him, I mean, he is, he, he is indeed angry about what happened. I mean, he believes what he said, you know, he makes, I, I would dare say, I mean, I talked to a lawyer about this. I would dare say he makes a compelling case that this was a Brown Act violation. Mm -hmm. If there will be a penalty for these supervisors, it's hard to say. And it, you know, they're not going to like reverse the decision or anything. Um, but you know what it does for his camp is it keeps this narrative alive that London Breed is excluded from everything, that she's an outsider, but that she triumphs anyway. You know, you can't keep her down. Um, and that is a theme of her campaign. And, you know, I mean, that it also explains why this is, yeah, everyone asks, you know, like, well, why is he doing this now? You know, like the newspaper articles about the serial meetings came out back in January. He's doing this because the narrative started to die. People started thinking about other things. You're Mark so Leno cynical. released his homelessness pack. You're, you're so cynical. <laughs> Sorry. No, but it is. It started to die. And so, like, you know, bring it back. Well, one thing I thought was interesting. So one of the publicly stated complaints that uh, Supervisor Aaron Peskin and uh, uh, I forget her name, another supervisor who, who spoke at this momentous Board of Supervisors meeting where they voted to replace London Breed with Mark Farrell, the complaint was Ron Conway. So Ron Conway being this billionaire tech investor mm -hmm. who uh, backed Ed Lee um, and they were saying he's got too much power, it's that's, you know, machine politics and such. I thought it was interesting, we were talking a bit about this before the program, this kind of breed is, is supported by, by Ron Conway, but this allows her to kind of take the mantle of, instead of I'm part of the Ron Conway, you know, big money machine, I'm the underdog. You know, I'm the one who who, who and needs your fault for that. In fairness, I mean, like, the progressives have been kind of railing against Ron Conway mm -hmm. since 2010. I mean, 
Ron Conway, he also donated big to the March for Our Lives. I mean, you know, he also does a lot on immigration policy. Like, the whole, like, narrative of Ron Conway as villain, it's a little ambiguous. It's a little abstract. He's not Charles Koch. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, the narrative of London Breed as the underdog, people can see it. She grew up, She's an African-American woman. Mm. She grew up in public housing. I mean... She is entirely, she is a person who, like, like her or not, like, she seized every single opportunity that was presented to her. She's entirely self-made. That's just easier for people to see. It, it's also, oh, I mean, I don't know if irony is the right appropriate word, but uh, the, the individuals, at, especially at that he, um, meeting, mm -hmm. were, you know, railing on Ron Conway, but then who do they put in the, the as acting mayor, but um, Farrell, who himself is a rather wealthy, uh, another wealthy white, white man. And he is <laughs> Ron Conway's best friend yes. on the board. Yeah. <laughs> and that is so, known. He is a venture capitalist. Cognitive you know. dissidence going on yeah. there with, with the argument, which I, yeah. I don't think helped their case by yeah. any measure, but definitely I think helps uh, London breed. Well, and, and someone asked from the audience, it's like, why was London breed replaced? Was it because they thought she would have too much built-in power in, in the gym. She'd be like, she'd be running as an incumbent, essentially, and mm -hmm. they, yeah. they felt as if that that would be unfair. Yeah. Um, Lord forbid we wouldn't want to have somebody have the title of incumbent running for re-election. Yeah. Um, but in, you, this whole thing about the Brown Act, um, I, I see your point about this, they can make a case that this was a Brown Act violation, but what about all these golf games that people play together? <laughs> I mean, yeah. these can all be you know, titled Brown Act violations. So if you have, if I go out to a coffee with you and say, listen, I'm going to support, you're going to support, I mean, that's how politics is done. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, and, and in all fairness, like, Brown Act is a California law. I mean, I have talked to people in the legislature who say, look, if we followed the letter of the law and the Brown Act, we'd like our whole political process in San Francisco would stop. Like our whole budget process violates Everything the Brown would. Act. You know, um, can I can I just say one thing to sure. that thing about why was London Breed? I mean, everybody has competing narratives on this, and everybody is right. You know, <laughs> I mean, from the progressive side, London Breed was removed because she is a moderate her being acting mayor and staying acting mayor until June 5th mm -hmm. would give her a big leg up um, in the election. She's running against two progressives or the other leading candidates. Um, so yeah, it was a political power play. I mean, it was also, they, it was also part of the board's normal democratic process. I mean, they are supposed to, install an interim mayor. I mean, you know, London Breed was also trying to wrestle up six votes <laughs> so she could be the interim mayor. I mean, right. so yes. And yes, there was, you know, a, a, a legitimate concern that she was, uh, that she was serving as board president and as acting mayor at the same time and that she had too many appointments on commissions. Of course, you know, the other alternative would have been going to her and saying, Give up your board of supervisors presidency, or give up some of these committee ship. You know, yeah. Maybe you know it, it was they clearly True. wanted her out of that position. True. True. Um, well, if the if the intent of this was to what put a dent in her campaign, not sure it's worked because if you've seen the most recent polls, she's in first place. Right. And Mark Leno, who is in fact Aaron Peskin's candidate, uh, and and some of the others on the left, is not in second place. It's in fact Jane Kim who is in fact our supervisor here in, in the district where we're sitting right now. Um, so London Breed it is, is, at least for the moment, she's sitting in the, the what, the catbird seat? Is that the right phrase? Well, but isn't it, isn't it, I forget how this works. It's been so long since I've covered this, but she became board president because she got th the most votes? Yep. Yeah. Of the, of the public? No, uh, no the, of, of, the board the, of the board. Of the board. And, well, the uh, board installed her as the board president, and yeah. then they said, oh, wait a minute, she's running for mayor, we got to get rid of her. That, that's a bad look. <laughs> There's a lot of bad optics, I mean, uh, surrounding all of this. I mean, yeah. if you really, from a political standpoint, uh, set aside policy for a minute, but yeah. just think about p the politics of it all. 
I mean, that he, that that board meeting was, I mean, just prime political you know, candy for the breed yeah. campaign. Um, and then everything that has happened really since, it's kind of trickled out, has been, and I'm speaking as an outsider, I'm in LA, yeah. and I'm seeing kind of bits and pieces of it down there. So, I mean, for, for her, it's great. But then also you had on the, on the progressive side, you have, you've had Mark Leno, who's basically been running since he was termed out of the state Senate. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jane Kim jumps in, which essentially is splitting the progressive vote. And I know San Francisco has kind of the instant runoff system, so that kind of changes the political calculus a little bit. Um, but still, to have kind of two competing progressives trying for the limelight, trying for the donors, trying to, you know, to, to make their case, um, it muddles the progressives' message, I think, a little bit um, as well, which then increases London Breed's candidacy even more so because if there's one dominant moderate voice and I, I love your nomenclature up here in San Francisco. Yeah. Moderates are not moderate by any measure. <laughs> right, um, yeah. But it's, so it, there's, a, there's a, some, the, the politics of it is just fascinating um, that you don't really tend to see too often in, a, in Los Angeles mayoral elections. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Someone actually just wrote in about the, the whole use of the pro term progressive and our board of supervisors. And, um, Blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let's, uh, actually, I just wanted to say something else. I mean, Breed is performing very well currently in the polls. And uh, if the narrative of, of some of her opponents is, is true, that people are sick of you know, the whole, uh, the Conway machine, the politics of Newsom and Lee and, and Brown, I mean, they're not saying that to the polls. You know, that, it does seem to be a bit different. I mean, I, I'm just, on w one last point, just from uh, uh, seeing kind of the seeing this from afar um, is really housing. I mean, housing has become, um, so. I think, a, a very pitiful, pit, pitiful, pit, pitiful. I'm sorry, I'm struggling with that word there. <laughs> pivotal. Wow. I just got off an airplane, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> pivotal or pitiful. <laughs> exactly, it, really it could be both. either yes. way. Um, I'll take both of them. Um, it, it seems like there, there, there's really kind of a strong kind of, you know, anti-housing versus ha housing sort of kind of dynamic going on, mm -hmm. especially with the Kim campaign uh, coming out very strongly against Scott Wieners, uh, SB 827, which doesn't, not too surprising considering that Scott Wiener beat her um, in for that state Senate race. We, we could, and we could do an entire program yeah. on 827. <laughs> In the briefest thing, that, that's the, the law that would allow uh, increased density and increased height for uh, housing developments that are along, right around um, transit centers. Tra transit centers yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, again, there's that element yeah. that's definitely playing out. Um, and it, it, it's definitely a worthy one because there's office, obviously a lot of resistance, political resistance to new development here in the, the city of San Francisco, city of county of San Francisco, but also could it backfire because you are starting to, we are starting to, you're starting to reach such critical levels of unaffordability in the city where London Breed does have a very um, strong argument uh, for her basically having grown up in public housing and kind of getting out of public housing and, and from a housing perspective. So um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if housing becomes even more central um, not only just the debate of kind of how uh, Breed was removed. Yeah. Someone from the audience actually has a quote from London Breed, which I apologize, I'm not going to read because it includes two swear words. But uh, <laughs> it's basically saying, is that the sort of rhetoric to use? She's known for some salty language. Am, am I correct, uh, Rachel? Yes. <laughs> I, I can guess which quote was included. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll show that quote in a special late night edition of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for now, let's kind of do a roundup of all things Donald Trump. Uh, people have rightly asked us not to focus as much on President Donald Trump, so you will notice we did not start with this. But uh, I think that's the first for the time. First time I've been on the panel, he wasn't the, the topic of conversation. Yeah, isn't that exciting? <laughs> yeah, it's like brand new world we're in here. But, 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 but here we go. Well, he is the president, and he is a news creator uh, par excellence. So uh, we do have a lot to talk about in kind of our omnibus collection of Trump stuff. Um, and let's begin with what quite a lot of people are talking about, which is this little interview that took place on 60 Minutes. Um, just maybe by a show of hands, how many people watched no, 60 no, no. Minutes? No, no, How many people did not watch it? How many... Look at this, look at this. <laughs> it's quite a few, but it, yeah. I would say the majority did. Um, <laughs> and now, did all of you watch it? Did I followed it on Twitter. 
Okay. Yeah. And, and, and you both saw it? I followed I, the recording. I watched it. Well, I, I, mean, I recorded it and then came yeah. back and watched it without the commercials. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, CBS. Well, I mean, what, I, I did watch it, and I, I, I thought what came out most strongly to me was that, you know, there was nothing new in that. We've, we've heard this, and, and it was uh, really just kind of hearing it straight from her and, and uh, getting a bit of background on things. But I want to ask you what you think. My impression is the person who f is perhaps most in danger as a result of that is Michael Cohen, Donald Trump's lawyer, who is kind of the one people would be pointing the fingers at about you know, the claims that uh, she was physically threatened and, and, and uh, you know, some very hard-elbowed hard uh, political tactics or legal tactics taken against her. But uh, any thoughts on the, the program? Do you, was it worth it? Is this much hullabaloo about nothing? Because we do, we do someone wrote in a question that we, we do see, or a comment, which is that, look, what happened between them 12 years ago is not, you know, any of our business. I, I, would, I would say that what happened 12 years ago is none of our business, but what happened right before the election is our business. Mm -hmm. um, and I have no trouble, I don't think anybody would can sit here and say that they don't think, I mean, he has denied having an affair, having, and, and we'd learn now it wasn't an affair, it was a one night stand, basically. Um, he's denied that, but I don't think anybody who really knows him and knows of him would believe that. And I think that's the biggest problem when you keep saying, no, I didn't, no, I didn't, no, I didn't. But everybody is sitting there saying, well, but this, from what she's saying, yeah, this is the kind of thing that you would do. But when you talk about Michael Cohen and the fact that he took it upon himself without any direction to go to somebody who the president had not slept with to pay $130,000 so she would not talk about what did not happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a problem with that. I think that was I, very nice of that. That strange credibility. We, we all agree. Yeah. <laughs> Carson or Rachel, your thoughts? I see, I see kind of two elements. One, you know, Bob gets at this, you know, it, what, the fact that this happened so long ago, not really relevant. What is relevant is really kind of this, the cover up piece, piece of it. Um, and that's potentially what could get legally problematic uh, for uh, President Trump and or his White House or his team. And, and the core of that, if, if, if I'm, if you agree, I don't know, is, is that the, this wonderful gift of money that Michael Cohen gave, <laughs> he says out of his, his deep love for, for Trump and his family and his company, um, that that constitutes a, a political donation yeah. that of course is way beyond the limits. Right, right, there's, a, there's that element which could create some legal difficulties. The second element is is this the straw that breaks the back for the religious right? You know, nope. the, the, the nope. Trump has somehow retained um, a rather decent level of support amongst the leaders, particularly of uh, the conservative religious movement, uh, but then also amongst many, many followers. Now there's some you know, androgyny there with kind of what other issues they may also be supporters of uh, the Trump agenda. Um, but that they're willing to put up with a lot of this, this because yeah. it's probably abortion that they're most concerned abortion, about. Abortion, the Supreme Court, you know, th yeah. there may be kind of economic reasons as well uh, that, are, that are driving their support. But for the leaders, is this the, 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 the stand, this is, is this kind of, are they willing to die on this hill? Um, so far, yes, you are correct. No, they have not <laughs> right. uh, really kind of gone off um, support of his. Um, but is this a, something that they turn to at a later point, say after the November elections, when Republicans have lost significant seats, potentially, maybe the majority in the House? Um, you know, then people start pointing fingers. Um, then you know, the, the, the sharks start circling. Um, and this may be then what they kind of use as a rationale to start to say, hey, maybe, maybe a President Pence might be better. Oh. Well, I mean, yeah, they might say that, but is the Republican Congress really going to do anything about it? At this point, um, we've seen there have been more, quote, violations of the presidential office that I've seen um, in the first year than we've seen, and I was no fan of George W. Bush, okay, because of starting the Iraq War, but God, he sure looks good right now. <laughs> I mean, I'm, just, I'm sorry, that's just, but I, I, you know, I don't know what it could take, if anything, 
to get those people that think the president never lies and believes everything he says to turn on him. Um, I, don't, I don't see it. Okay. Um, let's uh, talk about the next topic of Trump. Well, I was getting the sense that you're kind of like, okay, move on to something a little <laughs> less seedy. Um, there the are, the, 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 uh, he's created jobs. Playboy there are game. lots of open positions in the administration right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think people are, you know, have a chance, they're like, I can get that job. Uh, so we've seen a great deal of turnover in the Trump administration of late. Uh, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, Trump Attorney John Dowd, and the FBI's Andrew McCabe have all recently left. Um, and Melania Trump seems to be keeping her distance from the White House. Uh, <laughs> Carson, uh, in fact, Republican uh, attorney uh, Ted Olson, there was some talk that he might be joining the, the Trump legal team on the Russia deal. And he specifically said, when he, he publicly made a statement about why he did not join, he said, this is not a quote, but you know, th this, is, this administration is just chaotic. It's chaos. You can't get anything done. Um, do you think the president, of what we know, in your mind reading abilities, do you think the president wants it chaotic? He prefers it chaotic. That's, that's the way he, he runs things. That's kind of Trump Tower way of running things rather than you know, the, the old staid White House bureaucratic way. Well, first off, I'm glad I don't have some sort of telekinetic abilities <laughs> with uh, the president or his team, because <laughs> I think I would go crazy. Um, but you know, I, this is tough. You know, I feel like parsh, this is partially, um, Trump essentially being forced into supporting and picking certain people the first go around, second go around, maybe third go around, depending on which um, position you're talking about. Um, and now he essentially, that, that he kind of has been in the office for you know, a year plus, that he now has a little bit more kind of leeway. Uh, he doesn't have Ryan's you know, telling him kind of what needs to happen um, sort of deal. Now he can kind of pick and choose who he wants um, in it. But also, I kind of feel like he, he spent so much of his life being the head of the Trump organization, which it was him. He essentially was right. the, the dictator of the Trump uh, organization. Uh, what he said happened. Um, his inner circle was essentially his, his, his children um, who <laughs> listened to him, you know, and who he actually does listen to, uh, his, his own children. Um, so I, I feel like he's trying to replicate that in the White House, but because the White House itself, just, just take the White House alone, is such a more, uh, a much, much larger organization, uh, but then let alone the entire executive branch, um, than what he's used to running in the, in the private sector, I think it's getting a little bit overwhelming, and so this chaos is, is really getting out of control. Um, but he's still trying to retain that control uh, from within. Um, so you're kind of seeing this kind of clashing of his management style versus what the reality of running a government organization is. I mean, right. hasn't he said he thrives on chaos? Mm -hmm. Like, oh. why, why would you tweet someone's firing if you didn't want to create a big commotion? Like, Be before telling them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a very spiteful like, person. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's the big Exactly. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I remember hearing, like, I'm, I'm not sure if it was uh, Sanders who got up before the White House press corps and said that the president wants to bring in his people. And I'm like, but these are all his people that right. he brought in. Mm -hmm. So that's what I can't understand. I mean, there's going to be some turn, some turnover in the White House, but I think in some cases people are just... If you listen to people who work in the White House, and you know, one of my friends uh, reports for CBS there, and I've talked with him privately, and I don't think I'm you know, breaking any confidences by saying this is totally insane. You know, the things that they see every day, people that they talk to. Um, yes, you could. The, the president can say that the morale is great; it's a fine-tuned machine. But the people on the ground there see something totally different, and I, and I, you wonder just how long it's going to last, and you wonder why so many people are moving on because normally you work four years in the White House, you can go anywhere you want. Six months to a year, it's still not bad, but the, the person that, that I'm the most surprised about leaving is Hope Hicks, mm -hmm. who was like his you know, right-hand, always-there person 
who is out of there. And we don't know the circumstances, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if she said, you know what, I've had enough, I'm out of here. Well, she said she told little white lies for Trump. I mean, kind of have to leave after that. No, but the white lies, I mean, the president's president's not not in his office. I mean, all secretaries do that. You know, all assistants do that. (laughs) But, you know, if she thinks that the white lies she told are enough for her to leave, then they weren't white lies. They were just straight out lies. Uh, someone from the audience says, so now we're counting on Mad Dog Mattis to protect us from Bolton. Uh, so John Bolton <laughs> has been tapped as the new national security advisor. He was, is, a foreign policy hardliner. Um, John Mattis, ex- James Mattis, excuse me, the Secretary of Defense, uh, was quoted today, I saw it in the Hill, it might have been reported somewhere else, as saying he's not sure he can work with John Bolton. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Your, your hopes for sanity might be resting on a man named Mad Dog. Um, <laughs> but uh, you, 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 did you know uh, yes, James yeah. Mattis at yeah. the Hoover Institution? Yeah, I, I, I'll say this. I, I mean, I worked, I mean, didn't work with uh, General Mattis, but I definitely saw him in, in, while in my, in my capacity at Hoover. And it, his Mad Dog uh, nomenclature is something that his, his troops gave him. Uh, because you know, when you're at war, you have you have to have a different persona when you're leading uh, people um, in points of combat. Um, he is the absolute um, definition of a um, an intellectual when it comes to really kind of how you think through problems and uh, come to a, a decision. So I continue to have the greatest faith in uh, the Pentagon with him at the the head of it. Um, how he feels about other people, I have no clue. Um, but, I mean, th- there's definitely diff- differing opinions. Um, there, I mean, from day one, there have been differing opinions uh, amongst the national security uh, sure. individuals who've been, um, who were appointed and then um, who have held that position. So uh, part of it's in DC. There's always going to be um, conflicting opinions. Um, the, the difference here is usually there is a very strong um, viewpoint f- coming from the Oval Office of where those opinions need to be channeled toward. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of hard to kind of see that right now with kind of where the Oval Office is kind of directing foreign policy, national security policy, beyond chaos. <laughs> I, I have to point out that James Mattis, Secretary Mattis, will in fact be at the Commonwealth Club on April 14th. And those tickets actually are going very fast. So if any of you want them, I would suggest you get your tickets very soon. Are they refundable? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking in his place will be, J- will be uh, John Bolton. <laughs> Here's a question from the audience. I don't expect you to particularly have an answer for this. I just wanted to read it. Can we prevent Trump from crashing Prince Harry's private wedding and terrorizing the queen, causing tension with England? <laughs> Rachel, that's all you. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> He's not been invited, has he? I don't know. I know the Obamas have. Well, they have. Oh, well, a, as far a, as I know. It's a private family Shade. affair. Yeah, yeah. It's That's not, true. It's not, yeah, a state, it's not a state not wedding. It, it's it? not a state yeah. wedding, so it's a private family affair. Okay. With mm. hundreds of heads of state. <laughs> <laughs> boy, uh, you, boy, the tweet storm will be pretty, pretty intense <laughs> that weekend. <laughs> well, the rumors are that uh, Veterans Affairs Secretary David Shulkin? Shulkin? Shulkin. Sorry? Shulkin. Shulkin, thank you. Is rumored to be the next administration figure to be fired. So uh, I'm serious. That's what they're, they've been saying in a number of stories, and that kind of has been the pattern that uh, uh, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're made aware that the president is unhappy with this person. He's probably going to be fired. The president says he has the utmost respect for this person and then tweets a day or so later that he's gone. So I, I'm hearing that uh, Secretary Carson may be the next one out. Yes. Seriously? Uh, uh, that's what I'm hearing, but then yeah. we, you, you hear a different name every day. Uh, huh. Secretary Carson, if, if he is put out, I wonder where he's going to go <laughs> after throwing his wife under the bus about that table. <laughs> that was yeah. pretty bad. Maybe he doesn't want to go home. <laughs> so you think she's going to put him out too? I mean, you know, <laughs> you spent I mean, thirty-one thousand dollars on a dining room table yeah. in your office, and you say, "Yeah, you know, my wife, you know, I let her do it." And 
Yeah. And the next day it was a security. Uh, huh? It was a security thing. Then also the next day, <laughs> so it was first his wife, and then it was a security issue about the table. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, did you see the story about? Uh, I think we all saw it. I don't even know why I ask it that way. Uh, former Vice President Joe Biden saying, "Oh, I want to with Donald Trump," and Donald Trump coming back, and then. Um, you can kind of expect that response from Donald Trump, right? You, you, you challenge him, he, his whole thing is, I don't back down, mm -hmm. unless your name is Putin. But <laughs> is Joe Biden doing himself or the Democrats any good by you know, getting out there and acting kind of like a 14-year-old? Like Trump? Like Trump, sure. This, this isn't the first time he's done it. No, I mean, it, yeah. it, and that's kind of the part of the question is, he's kind of playing to his own stereotype as the guy who says stuff that makes you slap your forehead. <laughs> I mean, and yeah. uh, that's kind of always been the, the thing. And he's, he's a very smart man, but, um, you know, like I said, do you think he's doing himself or his party any good when he gets into that type of a fight with the president? It worked for Trump. <laughs> why not? Well, it worked for him because other people weren't doing it back to him. Why? I mean, Democrats should I mean, maybe potentially take a, a playbook of uh, the Trump campaign. You think you know? the Democrats should be, like, just as mean and... I'm, no, I'm, I'm being facetious, of course. <laughs> no, but I've heard yeah. the, that argument. I've heard that sure. argument made, actually. <laughs> well, you know, there is, there is the school of thought that the Democrats are just, they, they yeah. play too nice, they play by the rules. Yeah. Um, where the Republicans, you know, will do anything they want uh, in order to, to win. Yeah. You know, that, there's some truth probably to both of those. But in Biden's case, I mean, there's, he's rumored to be the front runner to run in 2020. I don't... You're uh, not serious. Uh, he's <laughs> I said, I said, rumored to okay. be. <laughs> but can you think of anybody else that would be the front runner at this point to run in 2020? Oh, obviously, London Breed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but no one expected her to be it. I mean, you know, the, the, the truth is, I, I think Biden is is fed up, and a lot of people are fed up, and Biden is, you know, Biden is is kind of like the president, in which he he has little filter. Um, some, but not not all. Uh, and you know, I mean, the old the Obama way of when they go low, we go high. I mean, Biden is. I think he's willing to sit sit down there in the trenches and duke it out. So he's so he's like, let me widen my sphere of influence now. <laughs> like uh, you, you, you two thousand Twitter. I followers. think I think things will be much clearer yeah. after November. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, let's talk briefly about some state races. Uh, we got some another round of polling last week, and uh, in that poll, GOP candidate John Cox is in second place behind Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom. Does that surprise anyone? What What do you think of that, Carson? Do you know John Cox? Um, Asking the Republican on the panel. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I hold the unpopular. Uh, opinion amongst those uh, who are center right in the state of California um, that I would much rather see a D versus D gubernatorial race. You, you said that. Explain that. Yeah. that why, why do you mean that? Um, you know, California has a lot of very, very, very serious problems. And if it ends up being Newsom, who is the front runner amongst, you know, in, in the polls right now, while a very soft front runner, um, if it's Newsom versus Republican, whether it's John Cox or Travis Allen, the other Republican running, um, the Newsom campaign can go into basically sleep mode. Yeah, he, um, he can go on vacation. He can go on vacation. He can ne never show his face ever again uh, for the next few months, uh, and he'll win by 15 to 20 points. Um, there will never be a serious debate. If, I mean, you'll probably have John Cox or Travis Allen on a debate stage, but you would never have uh, Gavin Newsom up there. Um, the reporters would, would be very hard pressed to actually get him to actually uh, take a stance on really anything. It's hard enough as it is. Um, and uh, there's be, there would be no actually debate of ideas about how to move Cal California forward. It would just largely be probably bashing what's happening in Washington, D.C., uh, which is pointless for a governor to be talking about because the governor is supposed to be focusing on what's happening here. If it is Newsom versus Villagrosa, Chung, Easton, any of the other Democrats who are running, um, then you have a situation where the, those two candidates are forced to actually meet and talk and, and debate and actually have a debate of ideas. They're going after the They're same, after the same things. They're going after the same things. And potentially trying to pull out the, those few Republicans, or at least you know, uh, Republican-leaning independents, who would vote uh, for the top of the ticket in that case. Uh, so you would actually get a much more robust uh, debate going on, especially amongst these type of candidates. 
because people always say, well, what about Harris versus Sanchez uh, in, the, the, in the U.S. Senate race in, uh, in 14? Um, there was no debate there, uh, really. <laughs> It it's really goes to the quality of the candidates. It, Newsom, Villagosa, Chung, uh, East in, in particular, are all v extremely smart, accomplished individuals who really understand the, the, the topics. And there are a few others, like Michael Schellenberg, uh, who runs the Breakthrough Institute over in Oakland, um, who you know, never, will never be mentioned in a poll, uh, but is running a very robust, uh, very policy-forward campaign. Um, and so you would, I think, get a lot of these, this good debate. So I was actually very unhappy to see John Cox pulling into, into yeah. the second spot place. Now, granted, all the second through fourth candidates are clustered within the margin of error, so uh, it's kind of hard to really tell who's in second versus who's in third. Well, we've been talking about San Francisco mayors, so to make you feel a little more at home, uh, Villaraigosa, former LA mayor, do you think he's still close enough up there that he could still uh, supplant Cox or? G yes, I mean, Cox, what Cox has uh, going for him is he has a lot of money. He, he's, a, he's a very wealthy individual, so he can put a lot of his own wealth into the race, which he already has, mm -hmm. um, which has really kind of helped him get to this point already. Uh, but Viragosa does have a lot of just built-in name recognition in LA, which is very pivotal when it comes to uh, particularly general elections. Uh, the Bay Area is very important when it comes to uh, primaries. Um, but you have to be able to uh, play a strong hand in, in, in L.A. County. But then also amongst the uh, Hispanic and Latino voters. Uh, so in the Central Valley, other parts of Southern California, uh, Villagosa has a lot of support there. Um, you saw it at the uh, convention that the Democrats just had. Uh, he really kind of riled up the, the farm workers union, uh, which is really his kind of his natural base, uh, which will allow him, I think, to make a lot of inroads elsewhere. Um, but it, it, it's, it, it'll come down to, I think, the last kind of last few weeks when people actually start paying attention to the June primary. It's still, if you look at the polling, the undecided numbers are still way too large to really glean too much out of kind of where people stand at this point, except that Newsom is probably going to make it into the, the, the top two. Do you uh, expect a Newsom uh, governorship to begin in January of 2019, uh, Bob? Um. Probably, and I say that, and I, I did do a, a, a forum with Newsom and Viragosa and Chung and Easton down in uh, Orange County, um, and you know, he, he clearly had the majority of the crowd there. Um, there was a lot of the union, it was a union, uh, union healthcare workers. So I don't see a scenario where he would be beat. Um, you know, he's got the support he had from San Francisco, um, I'm sure he has some support in Los Angeles. Um, Villaraigosa, yes, would, would, would be strong in the Hispanic community. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not, Newsom has already been a statewide elected official. So, you know, it's hard to take, it's almost like he's the incumbent. He's the lieutenant governor. It, unlike many other people, you don't hear about him. He, he's kind of very quiet. Because you lieutenant know, governor doesn't really do anything. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and, you know, Jerry is, Jerry does what Jerry does. And, you know, Gavin, I think, sits in the background and he's kind of like Mike Pence. You very seldom see him, but you know he's there yeah. somewhere, lurking. <laughs> <laughs> do you think uh, Governor Brown will endorse Newsom? Ooh. I don't, I don't think he, I don't think he will. Well, you know, really? he's, he's, he's in hit, general. He has no, no, you know, shucks left to give. I mean, <laughs> he might well just say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and throw it down and I'm out of here. See ya. I mean, maybe like Governor Brown has pretty deep ties in San Francisco. I mean, they're, they're families. He has, he has a house here. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the Browns and the Newsoms are very close families. Um, I mean, there was a there was a rumor like a few months ago that I think Willie Brown started it, but that Jerry Brown was going to be the next mayor of San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that he was just going to come in and be like, oh, that pothole over there. <laughs> and. But he lives in Oakland. From the he lives in Oakland. He. Yeah, he has a he, he has property. In move, yeah, he has, he, he sold the Oakland house, I think. He does have one more term uh, eligibility for attorney general, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> so wait a minute, if he sits out for another term of governor, can he run again in? Not for governor, but he can run for attorney general again. So he's totally limited out of yes. governor. Okay. Yeah. But he has one more term left for attorney general. So, depending on what happens with Becerra versus Jones, you know who who knows. Um, 
Before we get to the news quiz, I want to talk about the March for Our Lives protest from this past week. Uh, show of hands, how many people actually went out and, and joined the protests or the, the marches? A few hands, a few hands. Um, so uh, there have been, so the, actually it was not just locally and of course not just in Washington, D.C., it was across the country, even, even in other countries. Um, attendance numbers can sometimes be hard to get because you're not just talking about from the Capitol Hill police, now it's like police and such and observers across the country, but uh, the numbers I've seen put the United States attendance anywhere between 1.2 million and 2 million people. Um, start with you, Bob. What, what did you think of the protest? And, and Well, um, I didn't go. I was actually down in uh, Diablo Grande doing a Spartan race. Eight and a half miles, hills, mud, wind, rain. Congratulations. Um, yeah. It's, uh, um, I did, I, on the 14th, uh, when this kid walked out of school, I was in Pittsburgh. I went to Pittsburgh High School. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I took away from it more than anything else was the energy the students have, even on campus, but the fact that the registrar of voters did a very smart thing by showing up and registering young people to vote. If you're 16 and 17, you can pre-register, so once you turn 18, it kicks in right away. And I understand they did the same thing in D.C. So I think um, that, to me, is the legacy. I did a story yesterday. Uh, I went and talked to a professor from Cal State East Bay, and he said, you know, the march is over, but as Emma Gonzalez said during, during on, yesterday on Face the Nation, we're just getting started. And I, I do believe that um, the march yesterday if they keep up the, the energy that they have right now, is going to be huge in, in November because the millennials between, I think it's 18 and 26, only about 20% of them go to the polls, you know, whereas opposed to people our age, it's like 60 to 70%. If, if they flip that or even get close to that, they're going to get who they want elected. And I think that's what's going to happen. Rachel, did you? I, I did. I covered it for the, I happened to be on the Saturday shift. I covered the San Francisco March for the Chronicle. What um, was the energy like there? It was, it was really, um, it was really exciting. You know, I mean, it, it's clearly, I mean, although, you know, obviously the adults helped orchestrate it and, you know, pulled the permits and mm -hmm. provided the money, this clearly the genesis was teenagers. Um, the, you know, there were two hours of speeches at in front of City Hall, and most of them were teenagers. There was a survivor of Columbine. There were some Parkland survivors. And there were some survivors of gun violence in San Francisco who are kind of like, um, I guess the news media has been like putting them in a different category, people who aren't victims of mass shootings but who have to deal with gun violence in their everyday lives. Um, so there was a girl who talked about um, being caught in the crossfire of a gunfight when she was 13, when oh. walking home from school. So, um, you know, it was it was a really it was really um, fascinating. Also, I mean, like as a as a gumshoe newspaper reporter who has to cover a lot of these protests. I mean, like a lot of times, <laughs> you know, they're like, okay, wait for the Antifa to come out and see if there are counter protesters and, you know, like wait for the brawl. And like, there's like this rote ritual that we always, I, I guess I'm getting a little cynical about it, but like there's this rote ritual that we have to follow to cover the the protests in Oakland and San Francisco. And it's been the Trump versus the anti-Trump. And this one, there was none of that. Um, there was a police president presence, but they stepped aside. Were there um, any counter protesters at all? I saw one. I saw one in a suit. Um, <laughs> he argued with a few people and walked away in a huff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He was able to walk away though. <laughs> Unlike some of the other ones I've been to, where you know. I, yeah. I covered when when the president when the candidate Trump came to, I think in Burlingame, I think it was the Hilton or the Hyatt. I mean, they had it was crazy, and and this guy walked, guy had a Trump a Make America Great hat on, mm -hmm. and he's walking down the street through these protesters, yelling Trump, 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 right. and you know he was eventually able to get where he was going, but he needed to have a, you know the police had to come out, and I, I don't know why you would do that. I mean, on the one hand, 
You know, yes, it's wrong if you accost a guy and you beat on a guy, but why would you take a chance? Well, it's it's the kind of it's the mentality of the. I mean, Trump is like king troll, right? He's like king Twitter troll who fires people on Twitter, you know. And like a lot of the "Make America Great Again" protesters have this attitude of like trolling the liberal protest. It, yeah, you know? that the, the system mm-hmm. needs so, to be disrupted. And... Yeah, so I mean, but. From a from a journalist standpoint, from some, as someone who covers mm-hmm. these, you know, it was kind of refreshing to be at a protest where, you know, I mean, the police stepped back, the security detail was provided by these yellow vested, you know, peace ambassadors from, I guess, their vested women's march. Um, so um, it was it was refreshing, and there were a lot of a lot of kids there. And yeah. Very good. Carson, well, the. Uh, I mean, the, the NFL's New England Patriots are probably the team most associated with Donald Trump. You know, the, the owner of the team is, is a Trump pal. Um, and they made their team, or he made their team plane available to fly Parkland students to Washington for the protest. Does this movement reach out beyond just then, you know, the, the Democrats who have long wanted more uh, gun laws? Is it reaching beyond that, or what, what's your impression? Well, let's also remember, I mean, the, the New England is also a very liberal place. So, I mean, it, it, while this may be a, um, while they may have been a, a Trump supporter, I think that might have been more along the lines of they are, they, they run in the same circles sort of deal, not so much on ideology. Okay. Um, so, uh, I, I didn't go, I, I, I do, I have gone to some of the, some of the protests that have occurred since the November 16 election. Um, I didn't go to this one because I was uh, a selection judge for the Coro Southern California Fellowship. Um, so I was stuck in a building all day doing that. But maybe I'm just a, a political cynic that I, I honestly, we've, we've seen gun control flare-ups a lot mm-hmm. and nothing happens. It, it becomes it becomes a big flashpoint in the media for a period of time, and then when elections roll around, people are voting on different things, and um, they, you don't really see a change. You don't see a swell of gun control advocates uh, kind of uh, moving into the halls of Congress. Um, yeah, you can point to the '94 you know, assault um, ban, uh, assault rifle ban, um, but. That was a very anomaly, I think, when it came to a kind of a political tidewinds of just kind of things all just happening at the right moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and we're a much, much polarized, different place than we were back then. Um, so I, I, I don't see it. I mean, marching in San Francisco, you're going to continue electing Nancy Pelosi. Uh, marching in Oakland, you're going to continue electing Barbara Lee. La- marching in uh, LA, you're going to continue to vote for Jimmy Gomez. That's not going to really change the tide. Uh, what's going to change the tide is actually winning um, places in Orange County, winning you know the the the, the collar uh, counties of um, you know Chicago, yeah. winning the collar counties of Houston, Dallas, those sort of places, and. I don't know if this is really that's it's going to be what happens. You know, I'm a millennial. I would love to see millennials become actually the largest voting block. Where we are the largest registered voting right. block now, uh, but we won't be uh, in November 2018 the largest voting block uh, when it comes to turnout. Um, and these teenagers, yeah, they're r- riled up now, but I don't see them actually voting. A lot of things will happen. A lot of things will happen yeah. between now and November, and now and November of 2020. But you talk about some of the places where change can happen. And I, I've got to point this out, that there is going to be, there may be for the first time in a long time, a competitive race in the Fresno County. Um, I, I don't see that happening. No, no. I mean, <laughs> you never know. I mean, uh, I was down there was it last week, week before, talking to people. I was there for something else. And, you know, um, Ted Cruz, I'm not Ted Cruz, uh, Devin Nunes is, is, is on the people's minds down there. Devin Nunez is in a R plus 16 something seat. I mean, if the one that's going to go down is going to be Jeff Denham, but every year they talk up um, Jeff Denham and David Valdaleo's uh, opponents, and every year they win by 10 points. Um, so. I, I will say this the Jans who's running against Nunez, I saw a, something on Facebook. Um, it was kind of like an ad, but then it kind of wasn't an ad. And I'm thinking this is not a good strategy if you're trying to beat somebody 
who hasn't had an opponent in the last three or four elections. You need to come in and bring the thunder. You know, get Joe Biden to come in there and talk for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to our great panel today, Bob Butler, Rachel Swan, Carson Bruno. Thanks to all of you here today and everyone watching and listening online. Have a great week.